hello hello guys welcome back to another video so today we are going to discuss about amazon selling partner so this is uh, our the almost last chapter from amazon university so here you will be see the some video and some audio and some uh, story from those people who did the, um, uh, the business on amazon we will see the story from them and we will get the experience and uh, we will see also the uh, written information and also the some stories some videos okay like you see the information stories about trading on amazon so we will see the this is small business ideas so we do have the like uh, growth your business seller story so this kind of uh, opportunity we do have it here so you will see mm, uh, many of them so if you do in this channel just subscribe to my channel and just touch the bell icon and uh, if you have any question till uh, the, our the older videos so let us know we will be like to give you the answer as soon as possible so if you want any the other uh, um, points which you want we have to discuss so just let us know we will discuss for you and if you have the question you want to ask our live uh, on our uh, phone call and if you want to like us give an email you can give us we will like to give you answer so let's uh, start the, the our main topic because the amazon amazon giving us a lot of opportunity amazon giving us the uh, rule and tool and uh, policy regarding to your business we have to follow we, we can open the business all over the world uh, amazon fba and amazon fba so we have to follow the policy amazon and uh, we are just came here on amazon university page and we, will, we are learning from here if you have the small business if you have the big business if you want to start so there is a lot of information we are getting from the Amazon University. So if you want uh, to know how to make your uh, brand, uh, how to register your brand, how you make listing for your first product, your first sale, and if you have any confusion, so you can ask us. We will love to give the answer. So let's see. Uh, let's see about the very first video. Okay, road, uh, so this is advice, so let's see which one, I don't want to waste your time, I don't, don't want to go in so deeply, so see the very first one, so let's see this one, then we will jump to next one. Okay, guys. Trust among co-founders is essential to a small business. You can't succeed without it. All the legal protections in the world aren't going to help you overcome a fundamental lack of trust within your partnership. So it's great if you have that, but trust alone is not enough. Eventually, your situation is going to change one way or another. Someone might want to leave the business or change its direction. And it's in these situations that legal and contractual devices can help your business stay on course and maybe even prevent a problem from arising in the first place. Hi, I'm Andrea Marquez, and this is Small Business, a podcast by Amazon. This show is all about learning how to start, build, and scale a small business. And just so you know, I'm new to this. But I'm taking everything I learn in my conversations with business owners and experts distilling it into actionable lessons and filing it away in my small business playbook. By the end of this episode, I will recap everything we learned today into tangible, actionable takeaways for you to use in your small business journey. Today, I'm going to dive into starting a business with friends. The general advice is don't do it. Yet many, many people do go into business with friends or family and make a real go of it. So I really want to know, what is the recipe for success when it comes to working with friends? How do you divide responsibilities? And 
how do you protect yourselves? A bit later in the show, we're going to hear about this topic from a legal point of view. But first, we're talking to Rod Johnson from Black and Bold Coffee, the first nationally distributed black owned coffee company in the US. Not only do they make great coffee, they have a strong social mission. Black and Bold donates a portion of the proceeds to youth focused nonprofits, which is great. Like their coffee. And I'm serious about my coffee, so you can trust me when I tell you that this is the good stuff. Rod and his co founder, Pernell Cesar, started out small. But now their coffee is in major retailers across the country. And through it all, they've remained friends. So I can't wait for you to hear what that journey has been like for them. Rod, Thank you so much for being on This Is Small Business today. I'm very excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am equally thrilled to be here. Looking forward to a great chat. So let's dive right in. Tell me about Black and Bold and how it got started. Sure. So Black and Bold is the brainchild of my friend of of 20 plus years. And I pause in saying that because that that is a reminder that we've had to put up with each other's shenanigans for for the majority of our lives. But, you know, it was that that friendship that led us to want to branch out away from our corporate careers at the same time and look to build our dreams around something that we cared a lot about, that being coffee and community. Uh, So we got the bold idea to start roasting beans in Purnell's garage uh, and ultimately grew it into the business that we know today as Black and Bold. Uh, So essentially, we are a coffee roastery uh, located in Des Moines, Iowa, that essentially bridges the gap between community impact and specialty beverages. We give a portion of our proceeds to organizations that support youth in need across America. I always get super excited when I see the direct impact that anything I buy or any product I consume that it has in helping others or or the environment. And that's one of the reasons I really love Black and Bold. So taking us through that journey, how did you guys decide to even start working together? So I mentioned we had the the foundation of our friendship with that. We have shared values and similarities as to what motivates us and obstacles that we were able to overcome that, you know, just through lifelong conversations, we knew that um, if ever we we wanted to team up and become a, a dynamic du- duo in business, that we would have a, a little bit of an advantage given the overlap in that Venn diagram. And so it was an organic relationship that met a fork in the road, if you will, as it pertains to do we continue to climb this corporate ladder and run the rat race or do we try to change our trajectory and take a hold of our legacy um, and connect it to something that um, is more resonant to how we see the world. So it was just that that gumbo, if you will, that um, we leaned on to build our build our business and started in the first place. Do you think that you guys would have done something like this if it weren't with each other as co-partner? Absolutely. Uh, We are naturally wired to to be self-starters, to be go-getters and and risk takers. So whether it was together or on our own solo paths, I think entrepreneurship was in the cards for us. What was it about this? Is it the product? Was it the partnership itself that made this come to fruition and, and get off the ground? It's a combination of all of them. So let's start with the product. You know, this was something that we really cared about. We had spent a lot of time in coffee shops, given our respective corporate careers and having to do a lot of travel. You know, what's the best landing spot? It's your nearest coffee shop or your nearest Starbucks. And um, when you're in that culture, at least myself, I'm, I'm observant and I see how there's a sense of community within those establishments. And we knew that we wanted to provide that to people regardless of, of where they lived. You shouldn't have to live next to a coffee shop to indulge in a top tier product or or having that that sense of community. So it was just the affinity for the product in and of itself that I would attribute some of our success in getting the business off the ground. Side note, in another part of our conversation, Rod shared that he and Purnell grew up in Gary, Indiana, and there weren't a lot of high end coffee shops there when they were growing up. So the affinity he described for the product and community was really responsive to a need he experienced and saw an opportunity to meet. There was a a real 
definitive mission that we were trying to accomplish, this idea of conscious consumerism. You referenced that one of the reasons why you've gravitated towards our brand is that we stand for much more than just selling a product. And as of the fall of 2020, we earned our B Corp certification, which is the gold standard in businesses that are looking to prioritize purpose as much as profit. So, you know, having that at the core of our entrepreneurial endeavors, I think really compelled and motivated us to to see this thing through because the end recipient uh, is the demographic that we really resonate with. I'm constantly inspired by the purpose and mission of small business owners. It's almost always about more than just the business for them. But what makes these guys different is that they're building the mission on, in, and around a lifelong friendship. I feel like the stakes are higher for them if something were to go wrong. Did you guys have any uncomfortable conversations in terms of like, contracts and what happens if one of you wants to leave like what happens if one of you makes a mistake and i mean even though this is coming from friendship and from mutual love and respect you do need to protect yourselves and the business right so how did you guys talk about that yeah so we just had some very honest conversations and because we had that 20-year foundation it made it a little easier for us to discuss some of those challenging topics, like you mentioned, you know, hey, what happens if one of us dies, which is pretty morbid, you know, when you think about it, but it's it's an inevitable, right? It's something that is bound to happen. Or, you know, what happens if you don't want to do this anymore after five years and you want to exit, right? What are we building this towards? So we were just having those conversations and we figured that it would be best to do it early on while we were still friends, right? It's like, let, let's, let's talk about this while we still like each other, because if there's a point of contention down the line, it may be difficult to navigate those conversations at that time. And so, you know, very early on, we had an operating agreement that was our North Star, if you will. We, you know, divvied up our ownership percentage based on the, the responsibilities and the investment that, that we made at that time. And so we you know, tried to have as much structure in place very early on. So that then allowed us to focus on growing the business. That was our approach. And I recognize that not a lot of founders are in that fortunate position. And to that point, I'm, I'm grateful um, that my business partner just so happens to be one of my best friends. If I'm thinking about this from a small business owner perspective, and I'm barely in the stage of starting a business with my best friend, we haven't even you know gotten into these conversations yet. What would be your advice for the first questions you have to pose to each other um, in starting those negotiations? What is the end goal? Um, that was a, a question that continues to evolve as, as our uh, business ascends. Um, you know, are we looking to be acquired? Is this something that we want to hold on to until, you know, we're, we're old and gray and when we can pass on to our children? Do we want to bring on investors and uh, have other people at our, at our cap table? Those were, you know, some of those early questions. And then that will then influence what type, how you formulate the business. Is it an LLC? Is it a corporation? You know, do you not need a business partner? Should you just be a sole proprietor? And, and so we just let the conversation naturally progress. But uh, a good starting point is, um, you know, what what is the end goal? And, and that's really how you should start anything, at least in my opinion, is build something with the end in mind um, so that your your steps are always in alignment to that objective. And then one thing you mentioned was dividing responsibilities based on your investments at that time. What was that like? Yeah, so we are based in Des Moines, Iowa, which is where Pernell's wife is originally from. Uh, so Pernell uh, completed his undergrad at University of Northern Iowa, where he met his wife. They moved around for work, had their first child, and moved to Des Moines, Iowa. All the while... I was on the West Coast uh, living in Sacramento, doing my best job of avoiding the snow. And synonymously, we were building the business. So I was more responsible for curating the digital experience, standing up our philanthropic efforts and really all things marketing. While Pernell took on the heavy lifting of operations and finances, uh, as well as any legal matters that would eventually come about. 
And that's uh, essentially how we broke up the ownership and assessed a value to that percentage based on what we needed to get up and running. We needed to buy a sample roaster. We needed to retrofit his garage so that we could actually do the roasting. We needed some raw materials, et cetera. And so, you know, we did our best job of being as scientific as possible uh, and, and, and trying to, you know, make sure that things were fair and, and, and equitable. And to that point, I think that we're both satisfied with where we landed. When you mention Pernell, you have this little smile and you you can tell that you really respect and love him. Yeah, that's my that's my real friend. You know, I mean, we, we've met each other when we were 13 years old and we've been through a lot together. I mean, I, I've watched him grow up, though we're the same age. Like I, I had the privilege of watching him evolve into an executive. Right. You know, this is the same little kid that. You know, I, I used to bully on a basketball court and, and now, you know, he's the, the CEO of a profitable business um, that that started in his garage. So I'm just super impressed by him and um, tip my hat to him as much as I possibly can, because um, he deserves it. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy to sing his praises. I hope he listens to this podcast when it's out so he can. I'm going to make him listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> So going back um, to more legal things, when did you guys know it was time to bring in a legal advisor or, or a lawyer to actually come and dig deep into these into this contractual partnership? Yeah, very early on. Purnell gave me the initial call asking me if I drank coffee August of 2017. It's like, hey, man, do you drink coffee? And at the time, not a coffee guy. Uh, and that was, I, I, I pinpoint that moment as to when Black and Bold started. By December of that year, we had an LLC um, as well as uh, an, an operating agreement. So we moved pretty fast. Wait. So you're a coffee person now, right? Hopefully. I would say by definition, yeah, I drink much more coffee than I drink tea. At the time, I drank tea like two or three times a day, whether it was chai or, or green or uh, some type of black tea. That was that was my jam. It was my thing. Uh, but and that's because I really wasn't exposed to the higher grade of coffee. I'd only I associated coffee with this terrible drink that get that caffeinated you that gave you an energy boost right that i saw my grandparents drink some pretty low quality coffee for years and i didn't even know that there was another world out there and um pernell had actually sent me some beans he's like you should try these i'll tell you how to brew it and you know we'll and then tell me afterwards the drink and i was like oh I, I actually enjoyed this this is pretty good and um that started me going down that rabbit hole of the coffee industry so yeah it was just a, a random conversation like do you drink coffee dude and and that just snowballed into building a business curious to know what happens if you disagree yeah uh which happens often uh we <laughs> we, <laughs> we um we're very passionate individuals and there are some times where uh, we, we bump heads and, um, you know, we defer to the greater good. Uh, we know that the the disagreement or the dispute is not rooted in anything malicious that is coming from a good place. It's all for the greater good. And, um, cooler heads prevail almost always. Right. We'll, we'll both lay out our arguments and um, we are believers in testing and learning. Not not for the sake of being vindictive, like I, I told you, so I know your thing wasn't going to work, um, but it's just more so to figure out, OK, what is the best plan of action? Like how, how can we come to a solution that benefits everyone that takes into consideration all of the nuance of, of this decision? So, you know, it's just a matter of you know keeping the main thing, the main thing. That's a saying that we throw back and forth to each other often. It's like, OK, but let's make sure that we don't go on too many tangents. Is it just me or do you feel like Rod would make a great marriage counselor? He just has this wise and kind of dispassionate way of looking at disagreements that keeps an eye on the big picture. And I feel like I know the answer to this already, but has there ever been a situation where a disagreement has led you guys to go back to your contract and be like, this is what we agreed on toward the beginning, so no. Fortunately, we haven't. I'm OK with the deferring, especially if it's an experiment and I can take a back seat to let your test go first. And then if it works, then great. That was the right decision. But if it's not working, let's pull the plug and then let's let's pivot into 
another idea. How did you come to the decision that he was going to be CEO and you were going to be CMO? Great question. It, it is largely attributed to our professional careers. So um, dating back to my undergraduate days, uh, I have been a nonprofit fundraiser. So I started off interrupting people's dinners, asking them for 20 bucks to donate back to their alma mater, all the way to reaching different heights w within that, that industry. While Purnell worked on the for-profit side of things. So it just made a lot of sense based on what we were good at, the, the, the skills that we brought to the table for um, us to, to have those roles. But I'll be very honest with you. As a small business, we do everything, right? So it's it's those are just so that other people can have some level of delineation between he and I. I mean, it's 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 impossible to be so narrowly focused when you're trying to build a small business. And what would your advice for future co-owners be? Be transparent. I think a lot of the breakups, a lot of divorces, a lot of professional disputes uh, are, are rooted in a lack of transparency. You know, if, if you trust this person, you know, with your livelihood, it, it, it behooves you to, to, to be open and honest with them and expect the same in return. Pernell and I, again, you know, have very direct conversations because there's no one else at the executive level within our company. It's just he and I. So we, 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 we have to do that for the sake of the business. We, we will be doing a disservice to the 20 plus families that rely on us for their livelihood if he and I are not upfront and honest with each other. So I just recommend for anyone that's going into a partnership with a friend or not to be as honest and um, as forthright as, as humanly possible. Do you think people should bring in legal advice the sooner the better? Absolutely. Normalize that. You, you normalize that in, in your interaction so that it's not awkward down the line, right? You know, they, they say that you should you should pray when things are going well. Right. And not just when when the sky is falling. And that's kind of the case, you know, for running a business. Like, you know, in case of emergency, break glass. Let's just know what that lever is so that when it's time to actually break the glass, we're, we're not frantic and, and, and running around like chickens with our heads cut off. So normalize that as, as early as possible. And I think that you'll be better off for it. Rod, thank you so much for your time and for being on This Is Small Business. Thank you. I appreciate you. You're listening to This Is Small Business, brought to you by Amazon. I'm your host, Andrea Marquez. I loved the lessons Ron shared about being transparent, working to your partner's strengths, having difficult conversations first, and making sure to always have the end goal in mind. On this show, I want to continue taking you guys through my journey of figuring out what it takes to start a small business today by asking small business owners themselves and focusing on the pivotal moments, decisions, and challenges they're going through. Did you know that more than half of the products sold on Amazon come from small and medium-sized businesses? Black & Bold Coffee is one of the many small businesses selling on Amazon that have tapped into some of the tools and resources offered to help them succeed and grow. You can learn more about them in our show notes on our website, thisismallbusinesspodcast.com. This Black Business Month, Amazon is committed to celebrating, amplifying, and supporting a diverse set of businesses through This Is Small Business. And so I want to give a special shout out to some of our Black-owned business partners and experts who have graciously shared their wisdom on This Is Small Business. That includes Rod Johnson, Eva Jane Bunkley, Chelsea Whittington, and Corin Stephan Miller. And remember, one of the best ways to thank them is to support and shop their businesses. I also want to remind you of Amazon's tools and resources, which include the Black Business Accelerator. And I think that can be a great option for Black entrepreneurs to level up their own small business playbook and take their business to the next level. Coming up, sharpen your pencils because we're going to get technical. I called in the legal department. Naveen Thomas is director of the Business Transactions Clinic at New York University's School of Law. He helps people understand how to set up their businesses and partnerships in a way that will serve them when the going gets tough. Because everything I'm learning so far about business tells me things do not always go according to plan. 
Before we get started with Naveen, I want to take this time to ask you, how can we do better? Our team has enjoyed producing these episodes for you, and we want to make sure you're loving them as much as we do. So share your thoughts with us at thisismallbusiness at amazon.com. Naveen, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm excited to hear your thoughts on a couple of things. Thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here. The information provided in this podcast is not legal advice and should not be construed as such. Instead, the information provided is for general informational purposes only. Moreover, the information in this podcast does not create any attorney-client relationship between you and the podcast contributors or their respective employers. You should not act upon any such information without first seeking qualified professional counsel on your specific matter. You should contact your attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular legal matter. The hiring of an attorney is an important decision that should not be based solely on anything we speak about today. So I'm going to jump right in. How should small business co-founders set up their partnership? There are a lot of different possibilities. One of the first questions that people try to answer uh, when they're starting a business is what kind of entity should we form? Should it be a corporation? Should it be an LLC, a partnership or something else? If it is a corporation, what kind of corporation should it be? In which state should we incorporate? Those are all really important questions that need to be answered. They involve complex legal issues relating to corporate law, securities law, and tax. Actually, one of the biggest considerations there is each person's personal financial situation. So it's really important to get appropriate tax advice. That's one of the first pieces of advice I'll give to any anybody who's starting a business is to speak to an accountant. It's not something that everybody thinks to do independently, but the sooner you do it, the better. But even before you start an entity, you need to think about preliminary issues. And that relates to your business plan itself. Is it viable from a business perspective and from a legal perspective, especially if you're trying to do something novel, especially if you're trying to do something in the technology sector that's been not been tested. But even if you're doing a more traditional business, a lot of different legal issues could arise with your business plan. So try to work with an attorney from the planning stages to identify potential legal issues. You know, this may sound like a shameless plug for my profession, but it's not. You shouldn't wait until you encounter some complex legal tasks that you can't handle on your own. You want to make sure that before you start implementing your plan, that it's legally viable. For instance, if it turns out that your business plan requires you to obtain expensive licenses in all 50 states and you can't afford that process, you might need to change your plan. Uh, similarly, if you're doing a more traditional business, you might find that it requires certain licenses from local and state governments. Those aren't laws that you want to violate, and it helps to identify those requirements as early as possible. These are things that a lot of people would miss if they're not working with an attorney from the outset. Okay, that was a lot of important stuff. So small recap, ask yourself what kind of entity you want to form, which will help you determine what kind of partnership you will have. Consider each person's financial situation and get some accounting advice. At the same time, get legal advice to make sure your plans are viable. Got it? But what happens if you don't have the budget for all this necessary advice? I know attorneys can be quite expensive, but if you are a small business, especially if you're operating in a low income community or if you are a social enterprise with some kind of public interest mission integrated into your business model, then you might qualify for pro bono legal services from a variety of sources, uh, including a law school clinic like the one that I run. And some things to keep in mind when working with lawyers, don't just work with the first person you find. A lot of times people work with lawyers who are recommended by their advisors or investors. You need to work with someone who's representing the company not anybody else. Otherwise, you might get advice that isn't really in the company's best interest, but that's really furthering somebody else's. Also, make sure that you find a lawyer that has experience representing startups and small businesses, because the issues that arise with these types of ventures are very different from those that arise in large multinational corporations. So don't just get any lawyer, get a lawyer with the specific area of expertise that you need. I mean, these are all amazing pieces of advice and tools that small businesses have to keep in mind. And I'm kind of curious, though, 
even if there is trust and you found the right partner from the beginning, how do you make sure that all parties are protected and that you're doing the best thing for the small business and its future? So first, I don't want to downplay the importance of trust. Trust among co-founders is essential to a small business. You can't succeed without it. All the legal protections in the world aren't going to help you overcome a fundamental lack of trust within your partnership. So it's great if you have that, but trust alone is not enough. Eventually, your situation is going to change one way or another, as you just alluded, Andrea. Someone might want to leave the business or change its direction. And it's in these situations that legal and contractual devices can help your business stay on course and maybe even prevent a problem from arising in the first place. One thing that I often see in representing startup companies is that all of the communications, at least at first, are coming from one person who's kind of the, the point person for communicating with the lawyer. And this is understandable. Not everybody has a time to set up a conference call at the same time with the lawyer. But the problem is that there's a risk that the point person, the person who's communicating with the attorney, is the only person who is really communicating the, the company's needs and that the other founder's interests will not be adequately represented. So ideally, you should really make sure that all founders are communicating with the company's lawyer so that everyone's interests are covered. So how do you lay a good foundation so that if there is a huge major disagreement between co-founders, that everyone's protected and there's an easy way to come to that decision? Agree on certain terms in advance that will address common situations that may arise, like a founder leaving the company early. For example, a common tool for dealing with that situation is transfer restrictions on stock. So that before somebody transfers their stock to an outsider, they have to offer it to the insiders, the other founders. That's known as a right of first refusal. This is a way to prevent random people from becoming co-owners of your company without everybody's consent. So that's one thing. Another common tool is a vesting schedule, right? Where typically that might last for four years. And basically what that means is that if somebody leaves after halfway through the vesting schedule, then they lose half their equity, right? So this just, this gives them a, an incentive to stay with the company longer, right? So it might prevent specific types of problems, but no contract is going to be able to anticipate every contingency, every situation that might arise. That would be impossible or at the very least, very time consuming and expensive. A better approach is to come up with governance mechanisms that deal with situations when they arise. So that it's not just an unorganized disagreement, but that there's a formal process to follow in the event of any disagreement. Naveen, is there anything else that you think small business co-founders should keep in mind when starting up? Yeah, absolutely. A big issue that founders deal with very early on in the process is how to split the equity in the company. Right? A lot of people assume that everyone should just get an equal share so that if there are three founders, uh, it's a third, a third, a third. There's an inherent sense of fairness in this. And a lot of people default to that. But that's not always the most sensible approach. And if it's not the most sensible and fair approach, then eventually founders could get upset with it and decide to leave. If a founder feels like they haven't been adequately compensated, then that may discourage them from staying with the company long term. So when you're deciding how much equity each founder should get, consider all of their contributions and the values of those contributions. This got me thinking, what would my contributions to my company be? I mean, I do have a pretty good sense of humor <laughs> and I'm and I'm great with words. And then I think about Rod, who said he and Purnell each had different but valuable skill sets. So I asked Naveen, what are some of the different kinds of contributions founders and co-owners might bring to a company? So what could those contributions be? Those could be their services to the company, right? As an employee, what duties are they performing? What products or services are they providing? Are they contributing cash? Are they contributing any kind of physical property like computer equipment or uh, real property like a uh, physical space in which you're working? Are they contributing intellectual property, like technology that they've developed? 
all of these things should be considered and valued when determining how much equity somebody's going to get. And one other thing to consider is how much time are they going to commit to the company going forward? A lot of times you have founders who have very different contributions. For example, you might have one founder whose main contribution is startup capital, uh, but that founder might not remain very involved on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you might have another person who doesn't have any money starting out, but who is going to commit a lot of time to the business. So to really be fair to each founder and ensure that they are each going to think that they got a fair deal, which is what really matters here, you need to accurately assess each person's contributions to the company. So that's one really big issue that I think needs to be taken seriously. And it can be very complex, but not every disagreement can be prevented. And sometimes what you need to focus on is mitigating the adverse effects of a disagreement. For example, one thing that commonly happens in startup companies is that a founder is no longer happy working there and wants to leave. And you can't force someone to continue working with you. What you can hope to do is limit the damage that they can do to your business when they leave. And one of the ways to do this is to have every founder at the outset sign a contract with the company saying that all of the work that they do, all everything that they invent, all the intellectual property that they create in the scope of their work for the business belongs to the business. That way, even if somebody is to leave the company in the future, they can't bring their work with them and use it for another purpose. You could, of course, ask them to sign more restrictive, what we call covenants, uh, in addition to just this general IP assignment that I'm talking about. For instance, you could ask them to sign non-competition and non-solicitation provisions, but those can be a bit more controversial and they're not enforceable in every state. As Naveen has been explaining, every situation is different. But hopefully you got a bit of an idea of some of the possible things small business owners and entrepreneurs may want to consider when they form partnerships or when they incorporate their new business. Naveen, thank you so much for all of your valuable information and time. You're very welcome, Andrea. And that's it for this episode of This is Small Business. I hope you feel a bit more informed around the idea of going into business and maybe even going into business with friends. There was a lot of useful and super important stuff packed into this episode. Some of the key takeaways for protecting yourselves when co-owning a business that I'm adding to my small business playbook after speaking with Rod and Avine are, one, if you're co-owning a business, have the uncomfortable conversations first. This is important. Don't wait for something to happen in order for you to have those conversations down the line. It should be top of mind when going into a joint venture so that you can then focus on growing the business. One of the first questions you can ask yourselves is, what is the end goal? Where would you like the business to be in five, 10 or 20 years? And then work with the end in mind. Two, when having those conversations, it really is up to each partnership to decide how to divide ownership or shares. But one thing that Rod mentioned was considering each level of responsibility and investment. In the case of Black and Bold, Purnell took on heavy lifting in terms of operations and finances, considering they started out in his garage. Three, when you have disagreements, it helps to keep the main thing, the main thing. Keep in mind the bigger picture and don't go off into too many tangents. Four, also, it's a good idea to bring in accounting and legal advice as early on as possible and make sure your plans are viable. But don't just get any lawyer or accountant. Get a lawyer and accountant with a specific area of expertise that you need. Five, you can account for every problem that arises in the future when you're starting out. But a good way to address that is to come up with the governance mechanisms that prepare you to deal with those situations when they arise so that there's a formal process to follow. And finally, transparency breeds trust. Be transparent as possible with your partner and always keep the end goal in mind. Write these down. There's a saying I've heard many times from my family in Spanish. 
Cuentas claras, amistades largas. Which translates to, clear agreements make for longer friendships. And I'll add, and stronger businesses. On the next episode, I will be talking to a small business owner who started his small business alongside his brother from the back of the truck of his wife and now has his product in huge establishments like hotels, bars, cruise ships, and more. Meanwhile, if you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you can stay up to date with new episodes. Let us know what you think by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or email us at thisismallbusiness at amazon.com with episode ideas. And tell your friends about us too. Until next time, this is Small Business. I'm your host, Andrea Marquez. Hasta luego, and thanks for listening. This is Small Business is brought to you by Amazon with technical and story production by Jar Audio. Okay guys, so you know you are uh, missing the other video, the best story, so let's see where it goes from. Okay. Just letting this one right now because most of the people have the audio, so we will let this one. There was this all or nothing dogma of if you don't do this perfectly, you're Podcasts a terrible person are no or you're greenwashing because you're doing, this, you're not doing that. By 2024, it is so predicted that over that 137 million people, or 40% of the population in the U.S., will be listening to podcasts are enough, each which are month. Great. Major players from many industries around the world are producing podcasts to grow Hi, their audience, I'm Andrea Marquez, expand and their this program, is small business, and generate a podcast revenue. by Amazon. Today, this show Trayton is Digital's all about learning Omni how to Studio start, platform build, and scale a small business. Comprehensive enterprise by the end of this episode, I will recap everything we learned to today into tangible, actionable takeaways for you to use to in your small business journey. Shows users, today, today this I'm is the so glad you chose to listen podcast because I think solution. this is a super important topic. Your listeners expect your audio to be accessible everywhere. With Omni Studio, There's a lot you of can bad publish news content out there about to your listeners' favorite podcasting today, app with the simple click of a button. Who started Take a advantage of Omni's unique playlist mixing feature to curate to collections of episodes from world. different shows. Control access to your audio content to by using our secure distribution functionality, but I which know gives that you all the tools you need to manage exclusive easy. access. Place on these mobile-friendly the right audio players directly onto your website with customizable styles and colors to fit your brand. And yet. And it's utilize the platform's the pre-roll video and advertising capabilities to seamlessly monetize your web traffic. Expand so your how do you go with our array of social sharing close. tools. Today I'll and speak enjoy to sustainable transformation an increase in engagement Shannon with Ken. visualized audio by but leleging first, our integration I'm joined with Marina Tranvu, Track audience engagement on a granular level a that sells for every piece of content or monitor your plastics. audience growth across an entire network. As your audience grows, so does your revenue. Marina, thank Research you so much for being on This is Small Business Podcast advertising grew nearly 50% in 2019. Very and almost half of thank all you so ads much for are now dynamically inserted. Here. So tell me about Omni. Equo. Tell Leveraging me how Triton's we got world leading advertising technology enables you to, to dynamically stitch targeted ago. pre, um, mid, it wasn't and post roll audio ads directly into podcasts with built in volume normalization. 
to and ensure a high-quality listening experience and, and replace kind of pre-recorded ads now, in both new and back catalog content time. to allow for um, continuous and monetization and an evergreen listening experience. For radio broadcasters looking for more of a comprehensive end-to-end -end solution, so, that's just a really Omni Studios way of Advanced that, Live Broadcast uh, Catcher Capability is for you. Automatically out of label your on air like broadcasts right? so they are ready to share online immediately. To replace the complete on demand plastic. audio management so solution trusted by the world's leading radio back? and on demand and audio what publishers. Brought you to do something Sign like up this. online. What or was reach out the source of inspiration? To learn more. Honestly, the uh, inspiration for all this first off was when I first came to Vietnam. Um, unfortunately, it sounds a little bit sad, but I had no friends. <laughs> And I was in a foreign country. I, I didn't know anyone. Which usually happens when we move to another city, state, country, etc. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what I did to kind of occupy most of my daytime was uh, I went to visit a lot of the different cafes and coffee shops. And Podcasts Vietnam is very, very no well known for that. It's one of the largest exporters of coffee in the world. And basically in every nook or cranny, you will find a coffee shop. It could be a basement, it could be a random condo, it'll be down an alley. So I went to visit those and there was this all or nothing dogma of if you don't do this perfectly, you're a terrible person or you're greenwashing because you're doing this, but you're not doing that. And so I think that is part of our education and part of the way we're trying to change consumers' mindset is just doing the little actions which are enough and which are good. Hi, I'm Andrea Marquez, and this is Small Business, a podcast by Amazon. This show is all about learning how to start, build, and scale a small business. By the end of this episode, I will recap everything we learned today into tangible, actionable takeaways for you to use in your small business journey. Today, I'm so glad you chose to listen, because I think this is a super important topic, making your business environmentally friendly. There's a lot of bad news out there about the environment. But today, I want to focus on someone who started a business to make a positive contribution to a cleaner, greener world. I think this is something that will be important to me when I eventually start my own business. But I know that going green isn't always easy. It can be hard to source the right materials. There can be extra costs involved and, let's face it, a ton of research. And yet, it's something we need to do for the planet and it's something that matters more every day to customers. So how do you go green and stay afloat? Today, I'll speak to sustainable transformation expert, Shannon Kenny. But first, I'm joined by Marina Tran Vu, founder of Equo, a business that sells sustainable alternatives to single-use plastics. Marina, thank you so much for being on This is Small Business today. I'm very excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So tell me about Equo. Tell me how we got started and where you are today. I came over to Vietnam about three years ago. Um, it wasn't for the reason of starting this business. It was actually just to help out my family. I was only meant to stay for one year. And then unfortunately, the pandemic happened and I kind of got stuck in Vietnam, but I also started Equo during that time. Um, and Equo is a sustainable brand that provides 100% plastic-free and compostable solutions for everyday single-use plastic items. So that's just a really fancy way of saying that uh, we make products that are sustainable out of stable materials like grass, rice, coconut, sugarcane, and coffee to replace anything that's single-use plastic. So something that you use once and throw away, like straws or utensils or bags. And what brought you to do something like this? What was the source of inspiration? Honestly, the uh, inspiration for all this first off was when I first came to Vietnam. Um, unfortunately, it sounds a little bit sad, but I had no friends. <laughs> and I was in a foreign country. I, I didn't know anyone. Which usually happens when we move to another city, state, country, etc. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what I did to kind of occupy most of my daytime was uh, I went to visit a lot of the different cafes and coffee shops. And Vietnam is very, very well known for that. It's one of the largest exporters of coffee in the world. And basically in every nook or cranny, you will find a coffee shop. It could be a basement, it could be a random condo, it'll be down an alley. So I went to visit those. And uh, for the first time, I saw something green in my drink and it was floating. And I was like, what is this? And it turned out to be a grass straw. And so that was my first experience of a 
type of straw that was not made from plastic or paper. So that was kind of the first part. And then the second part was basically a couple of months later, my nephew was born. And I realized, you know, um, that he might have a tougher time of growing up in this world than I would. I was fortunate enough to grow up in Vancouver where it's beautiful, there's tons of nature. And I wanted him to have the same sort of experience. But at the rate we're going, you know, he might actually have to move to Mars <laughs> to kind of live out the rest of his adult life. And I just really didn't want that to happen. So um, that was us all my other inspiration. Okay, I know I'm new to this whole universe. But that's definitely the first time I've heard a small business owner say, I started my company so my nephew wouldn't have to move to Mars. And I mean, she's joking, but only partly. She's also kind of serious. She's motivated to create a better world for those coming along behind her. And I just love that. So I asked Marina to walk me through how her products are made and the impact they have on the environment. Each product is quite unique in how it's made. Um, for example, our coconut straws are actually made out of leftover materials from the coconut. So after all the water and the flesh and the shells have been extracted, sometimes you kind of get this leftover material and we add a bacteria to it, which eats away at the leftover coconut material to form a paste. So that's kind of one example. Um, another example is um, the coffee straws um, that we have are actually made from the used coffee grounds that are gathered from different cafes, um, in restaurants, um, and then put together and combined with another sort of um, organic acid in order to be molded into our straws. But the common thing amongst all of our products, again, is that they're 100% plastic free, they're compostable, and um, pretty much for all of them, they're made out of materials that would otherwise end up in the landfill. So helping really to promote that circular economy. And I'm just crazy curious, but did you have a background in this or how did you even begin? Not at all. My uh, studies and my background came in marketing and business. So I graduated from the University of British Columbia, Sauter School of Business, studying marketing. And then also for my entire career, I worked at companies like Unilever, Bacardi, LG, doing brand uh, and marketing for them. So product watches were something that I was very used to. But I think a lot of that uh, curiosity that comes with working within marketing a lot of it comes from trying to figure out what makes the consumer tick, what makes a consumer want to purchase something or buy something. And so for me, there is that curiosity there of why, you know, I see this green thing in my drink all the way in Vietnam, but I'm not seeing it everywhere else in the world. And so that curiosity led me to kind of look into the history of sustainable straws. And I found out that these were products that were existing for a very long time. So you're talking decades and centuries. These are not new products. But when you take a look at the market share of uh, sustainable straws other than plastic and paper, it was less than 0.1% market share at that time. So that means that there's something that wasn't resonating. Maybe it wasn't getting enough exposure or people didn't know about it. Marina's marketing curiosity kicked into high gear. She thought, these straws are great. The world needs less plastic and more grass straws. They've been around for ages. So how come nobody outside Vietnam seems to use them? So that's really kind of what led me down the path of building this brand, building a brand that would be eye-catching, that would educate consumers on the different sustainable materials that are out there, and also make sustainability fun. It was one of those things where, again, I didn't come from a sustainability background, but trying to learn about it and trying to come into that sustainability community, I did find that there were certain things such as gatekeeping around whether or not you were sustainable enough to be part of this community. And so I wanted to build a brand that was inclusive and fun versus what I had seen as my own experience trying to start my sustainability journey. Marina spotted how the question, are you sustainable enough, can feel accusatory and demoralizing for those who are just setting out on the sustainability journey. It can drive people away, which is not a good outcome. So kudos to her for overcoming that and creating a product and a brand ethos that feels accessible to everyone. Buying less plastic is something in everyone's reach. I'm going to ask a hard question, which I am sure you probably have been asked before. Does it actually make a difference if I, as a consumer, change my use of straws to be your kind of straws? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I would equate it to something like, you know, voting within an election. Most people think that, you know, I'm just one person, it's just one vote, it's not going to make a difference. But when you accumulate that all together, it does make a difference. All these little small actions that are sustainable combined together 
can have a really, really big impact. And if we had everyone just thinking that, oh, I'm not, it's not going to make a difference, and everyone's just going to continue to do the same action, which will harm the environment. But if everyone, or maybe even 10% of those people start to say, you know what, I'm actually going to make a little bit of a switch that could influence other people. And those accumulated actions efforts can have a huge impact. It's a fair point. But another hard question I felt like I had to ask, what about the process of sourcing, packaging, and distributing these eco-friendly products? I wanted to know how sustainable is that whole process? It's definitely a journey. The reality is that, you know, I think there's a lot of economies of scale, there's a lot of efficiencies that have come through business by non-sustainable products. For example, palletization of your products and how we ship products, you know. It might be in a plastic pallet or it might be in a plastic box instead. And we've gotten used to those things. And because we've gotten used to those things and they've been used for a very long period of time, the cost efficiencies are there. But as long as you're being truthful, I think consumers will be a little bit more receptive to the message. And can you tell me in what ways your business, the, the, you know, the making of the product is environmentally friendly? Well, I think there's a couple things that we do that are quite different. So first off, you know, just the product itself is very, very sustainable. The packaging that we use um, is either recycled packaging or recyclable. So I still promoting that kind of circular economy or that reuse and sustainable aspect as well. And then on top of that, my team is actually fully remote. So there's kind of some of the, I would say, you know, it's a little bit of a smaller impact, but it's kind of saving some of that time and carbon emissions from traveling to go to the office. And then from there, I would say that just in our advocacy, I know it sounds a little bit weird, but advocacy and education itself is sustainable in terms of its actions as well, because we're basically trying to get people to switch their mindsets as well as understand what else is available out there for them to adopt as in a sustainable behavior. It's really hard to change consumer behavior. It's easier to just fit into their lives how they're already operating. So what are you doing to influence your customer to not just buy your straws or your products, right, but also to be part of that mission of sustainability and have it seep into other parts of their lives? Yeah, you know, great question. That's actually the ethos of our brand. And our brand is about making sustainability as easy as possible. So for example, with our straws, they are all made to be single use as well. So the idea is that you would just use our straw instead of a plastic straw, and you're already doing better for the environment. You don't have to change your behavior. You don't have to carry it around or wash it or anything. You just use it once and you throw it away as well. But it's just made of a much better material that is 100% plastic-free and compostable. On the other side is the the way that we're trying to get people to change their mindset in a little bit of a different way is the approach to the sustainability category. So we actually do take photos of our products, you know, in plastic cups because sometimes people may not have a, a solution to a plastic cup. So we have, you know, our products like our coconut straw in a plastic cup and taking a photo of that because we really do want to emphasize that any small action helps. And if you're not doing sustainability perfectly, that's still okay. So I'm really encouraging that as well. I'm thinking about this from the perspective of our listener, of our small business owner, of our aspiring entrepreneur, who is maybe having this idea, but wants to make sure that, you know, the whole business aligns with this mission. What are the sacrifices that you've had to make as a small business owner, as a, as a business, to be able to live up to this? The reality is, is that right now, um, and, and I'll be the first to say it, being sustainable is more premium, more expensive to do for any sort of business, including our own. And those costs right now, we do have to pass on to our customer with the expectation that, you know, if we're able to get a lot of people to adopt our solutions, that we'll be able to bring the entire category sort of pricing and price point down. But the first off is just acknowledging that we're not going to be able to appeal to everyone and get all the customers that use straws right now, for example, or use, you know, forks right now to be our customers because of our price point. So it's really kind of admitting that and then really targeting those who can adopt our solutions right now. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we've had to sacrifice as a company is a lot of time, I would say. We do take a lot more time to educate people about our products, um, to get people to try our products, actually. And that's something that a lot of other probably non-sustainable businesses would have to focus on. You know, we're focusing on not just product education, but sustainability education aspect as well. 
a lot of what we do is actually trying to correct assumptions or misconceptions about sustainability or our products. or really trying to prove that we aren't greenwashing. And that can take a lot of time away, again, from, you know, some other things like operations or sales. Greenwashing is when a company does something on the surface that implies sustainability, like simply putting a green label on a bottle, but actually is not sustainable in any way. This is not what Marina is doing, but it doesn't stop the haters from hating. By Marina's own admission, it can be tough to step into the environmental business arena. You constantly have to keep up your research, defend your choices, and fight the good fight. But it's something that, you know, we think is extremely important to do and part of telling our story, but a part of also convincing consumers to switch to our products. Here's the challenge. Despite the fact that there's growing consumer demand for companies with a strong environmental and social governance record, or ESG, there are also entrenched systems and sometimes higher costs associated with environmentally friendly manufacturing and distribution. It's a tough problem for a new business owner, but Marina says she's learning to tell the story of her brand in a way that breaks down resistance to it, one customer at a time. One example she gave me was around the issue of cost. A lot of people say this plastic straw is one tenth of a cent, whereas your straw is like three cents or five cents. So why am I going to pay right now so much more for that? 50 times more, you know, 30 times more or whatever it has more for this right now. And I say, okay, well, right now, uh, what you're looking at is just the physical cost, but you're not looking at the intangible cost. For example, you know, this plastic straw, yes, it's one tenth of a cent, but guess what? It's going to break down into tiny little microplastics that are gonna enter your body, enter the oceans, enter animals, and start to have a lot of health effects. Those health effects to get treated will cost something. The disposal of these microplastics and those plastics will cost something. So in essence, that, you know, one tenth of set has now turned into 10, 20, hundred dollars and all the costs that are associated with that. So if you think down in the future, you know, if you're a little bit more forward thinking, then you'll see that maybe the cost difference is so clear cut as one tenth of a cent versus five cents. So that's how we try to tell the story and paint the picture. And so. That's one way we try to overcome it, but I know um, a lot of other brands struggle with that too. And again, it's all about storytelling. So how do you, as a small business, get your suppliers or vendors or, or just partners to want to live by that mission, the journey of figuring all of this out with you? I think when you give people numbers or show people context, they start to realize that, you know, this is a big problem that we need to address immediately. For example, you know, um, a report just came out about how microplastics were found in uh, human lungs and and the human blood for the first time ever. So that really, I think, puts things into perspective for a lot of people. And then the second thing I think we try to do is make sustainability something that is engaging and fun again. You know, there's a lot of doom and gloom that's always around. And like, if we don't do this, we're all going to die in the next 10 years, or, you know, all the polar bears are gonna become extinct. Um, When you have that narrative all the time, it can become a little bit, I would say, depressing almost as um, as a conversation to have. So we try to kind of turn around and, you know, stick a little bit of humor into it, try to make stable more fun. It's like, did you know that, you know, if you have a rice straw, you can also eat it afterwards. If you're really, really that hungry, you know, the the coconut straws are, are really cool because they're made kind of like this coconut sort of texture. The sugarcane straws, they smell like sugar. The coffee straws, they smell like coffee. So, you know, those are the type of things that I think will pique people's interest. I did not know that you can eat your rice straw afterwards. But now that I do know, I'm not going to rest until I try it. And I think that's basically Marina's whole sustainability message. No matter what kind of business you're running, there are things you can do to inch yourself onto a sustainable path. Just start small and give it a try. As we've discussed in other episodes, starting a small business is not for the faint of heart. Marina started Eco in the midst of a global pandemic while isolated from her friends and unsure of what the market would bear when it came to eco-friendly products. She has a few words for other people just starting out. I would encourage that, you know, if you're having a rough time, just know that there are thousands of other small businesses having the same sort of rough time. And if you really believe in, you really want to pursue it, you'll make it happen. You're listening to This is Small Business, brought to you by Amazon. I'm your host, Andrea Marquez. 
That was Marina Tranvu, founder and chief everything officer of Equo, spelled E Q U O. You can find Equo's eco friendly convenience products on Amazon. Did you know that more than half of the products sold on Amazon come from small and medium sized businesses? Equo is one of the many small businesses selling on Amazon who have tapped into some of the tools and resources offered to help them succeed and grow. You can learn more about them in our show notes on our website, thisismallbusinesspodcast.com. And just a reminder that a podcast only helps if you listen to it. So if you know someone who needs to hear this episode, I hope you'll share it as soon as you get the chance. And if you have thoughts you want to share with us, send us a message to thisismallbusiness at amazon.com. Okay, having heard Marina talk about the constant need to be educating consumers and industry partners, it seemed like a good idea to bring out a serious eco expert, someone with a lot of experience helping small businesses make eco friendly choices. So, up next, I want to introduce you to Shannon Kenny, aka Mama Eco. Shannon, thank you so much for being with us on This is Small Business. I'm very excited to talk to you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So, can you give me a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago,、um, born and raised there, and have lived in the States for about 15 years. And, you know, slowly merged my way from, you know, a life sucking job into doing what is, is really important to me, and that's focusing on sustainability. So, initially, I started focusing on the personal sustainability side of things. And then over the years, my business kind of shifted to also support businesses. And that's where my, my consulting comes into play, where I help mostly small to medium sized businesses realize the sustainable opportunities that they have that they may not be aware of. It's so different to think about sustainability when you're a small business versus medium versus a large corporation. And like what your footprint means is also entirely different, right? So, as a small business owner, in what ways can I make my small business environmentally friendly? A big sort of barrier to entry that a lot of small businesses come up against is they go, like, First of all, I'm wearing 10 million different hats, especially if it's like a solopreneur or a very, very small business with a small team. So, you know, to prioritize sustainability is, is, is often tricky for a lot of small businesses. And then the next thing they think of is like, well, I don't have the income per se to allocate to this. Like, again, small businesses are not, you know, raking in millions and millions of dollars、um, to allocate to, to this kind of thing. So, you know, It's really about focusing on the things that are in your control and the things that are accessible to you. So, a lot of clients that I've worked with, you know, they're a small, let's say, product business. And they'll say, with the size of my business, I can't customize my packaging because I can't do like a minimum order of 10,000 units. That's just not in my budget. So, a lot of small businesses, they can only really work with what's accessible to them. So, that's the first thing is just focus on. What's accessible to you? That may be packaging, that may be sourcing as many ingredients as locally as possible, that may be thinking about like your, your carbon footprint and how much energy you consume as a, as a business. It really kind of depends on the type of business you have. I'd like to hear your advice on applicable tools that I could begin thinking about that maybe across the board any small business owner could implement. So, the one very easy thing that any business can do is to make sure that your website is as eco friendly and carbon neutral as possible. So, a lot of people don't know this because it's not something that we see, but like a website has a carbon footprint. Every time we use our phone or our laptop, it has a carbon footprint, right? But there's actually web hosting companies that Offset the carbon footprint of your website. And many people might not know like how it runs in the back end. So, when you have a website, It's running all the time. And what enables it to run all the time is you have these server farms, which are basically just buildings with tons and tons of computers that are just running all the time. So, first of all, you have the energy required to run those computers to make your website run. And then those computers also generate a ton of heat. So, they're also being blasted with air conditioners in order to keep them from overheating. And so, that is what contributes to the, the carbon footprint of a website. I confess I hadn't thought all that deeply about the carbon footprint of a website before, but it makes sense. Something has to keep those pixels, uh, pixelating. But here's an example of one of those pretty simple to change ideas for greening your small business. 
And it's really accessible for any business owner to just switch their web hosting company. It's one of those things where it's like you just flick the switch. You don't have to ever think about it. It's if you compare the pricing, it's the same price. And in some instances, it's even cheaper. So again, looking at it from a a budget perspective, it actually could be in your favor to use a green web hosting company. And then one other sort of added bonus of that is they also make sure that all of the coding on the back end is optimized and very minimal. And what that means is that your website's also going to load faster and websites that load faster get ranked higher on on Google in terms of SEO. So it's kind of one of those things where, yes, you're doing the right thing, but you could also save money and, hey, your websites might perform better. So there's lots of these little added um, benefits. And, you know, that's something that literally every business can tap into. Wait, that's crazy. I had no idea that this was even possible. And I was about to ask you, but what is the sacrifice? Like, if I do do this, I'm imagining that there has to be some downside to changing my website to something like this. So then now I'm asking, why doesn't everybody do this? I think, you know, it honestly comes down to you don't know what you don't know. And small business owners, again, they have a million different hats that they're wearing. So they're not going to be going knee deep into this kind of nuanced kind of stuff. Once you know, then at least you can try to make that decision. And a lot of times when you sign up for a hosting company, you sign up for a year or three years or whatever it is. So, you know, if you already have an existing website, finish out your contract. And when it's time for renewal, then you can make that switch. It, it, it really just depends on where you are in that journey. There's this general notion that if you do environmentally friendly things, there's sacrifices and an additional cost that comes with that, right? So what are these changes that I can make that don't translate to such a large burden or sacrifice, especially with a smaller budget as a small business? There are always going to be certain things that cost more. For example, if you choose to create a product out of compostable materials as versus plastic, which is made from fossil fuels, it's going to be more expensive because you're, you're, you're opting into doing things the right way. Okay, so there will be certain things that presently will cost more because there's a lot more people who are buying and manufacturing plastic products than there are people buying and manufacturing compostable products. So there's a supply and demand issue where once more businesses and more consumers start to shift to those more environmentally friendly products, the cost is going to come down because that's just how you know economics work. So if you're looking at physical things like product, packaging, ingredients, that kind of thing, ethical sourcing. Yes, those things are going to cost more. But there's also a lot of things that you can tap into that don't cost more. So, you know, the web hosting is just one example of that. Another thing is sustainability isn't just about the planet, right? It's also about people. So as a business owner, it's very much within your control to make sure that you pay your employees fairly, you treat them fairly. And actually, when you have a very strong ethos or a core set of values as a business, When you hire people, they are more invested in your company, which means you have less turnover. It just translates to greater profit. So, you know, that's another thing as well. And then also in terms of just sourcing locally. So I know that a lot of your listeners are are product companies. The more that you can source as locally as possible and bring your supplier chain closer to you, then that's also going to be able to have cost benefits because you have more control over your supply chain. What kind of incentives are out there for small business owners to encourage them to take environmentally friendly measures? Are are there certification programs, discounts, things that might make business owners go, this is in my best interest? Okay, so here's the thing. The world is shifting towards a more sustainable mindset. We are hearing about climate change all the time. I mean, it's, it's literally coming at us from every angle. And the thing is, businesses can either choose to start shifting towards sustainability now, or they can wait until there's really not much of a choice, and then they're going to have to play catch up. So it's in a business's long-term best interest to start thinking about these things now so that they can plan and they can execute in terms of that. And then also, there's a lot of green certifications or environmentally friendly certifications like 1% for the Planet or B Corp. There's a whole bunch of them. And Customers actually look for those certifications. So it also helps in terms of transparency, where if a customer sees that logo or that name on your product, then they know that there's a certain level of integrity or trust that they can put behind that. And so it's almost an easier sell to a consumer if they are coming across your product for the first time and there's, you know, option A and option B and option B is part of 1% for the planet. 
I'm going to go with option B, especially if the price is the same, you know, or even if it's nominally a little bit more, me as a consumer, I'm going to go towards that product. So there's a lot of benefits in terms of those green certifications. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with those certifications because they're a great thing if they're used with integrity, but they can also be used to manipulate consumers and to greenwash consumers. And greenwashing is essentially when, you know, consumers are made to believe that a product is more environmentally friendly than it actually is. Absolutely. As we heard earlier from Marina, the practice of greenwashing is something that really confuses consumers and muddies the water for brands that are legitimately trying to make steps towards sustainability. Shannon says some green certifications are a good idea, but they're definitely not for everyone and they can be misused. It's a bittersweet kind of thing. And the next thing to think about in terms of those green certifications is a lot of them aren't financially accessible to small businesses because you do have to pay to play. Essentially, yes, you do have to do certain things in order to get that certification. But at the end of the day, for especially a very small business, it might not be accessible. So what I always try to tell businesses is like, if you want to work towards that certification, that's great. But focus on the things that you can actually do internally right now and communicate that to your customers and be as transparent as possible so that they know what your values are. Focusing in on the actual manufacturing of the products for a moment, what are some areas small business owners should think about in terms of going green? One thing is to think about waste in terms of your supply chain. So again, every time you can waste less as a business, whether it's on packaging materials, shipping, all this this kind of stuff, then that translates to savings, which translates to profit. So Let's take food, for example. They have a certain amount of food that gets wasted along the supply chain. That's literally money going out the door. So thinking about how can we re-engineer the supply chain to avoid that waste so that we can then, again, translate that into profits. The shorter something travels, the lower the energy is required to transport it. So just trying to think as locally as possible, how can you make your microcosm of a business as as small as possible so that you have as much in control so that you're not wasting as much and so you're not, you know, essentially spending on money on things that you really don't need to. Shannon, do you think it's possible in the current economy to create a thoroughly environmentally friendly business, supply chain, manufacturing and distribution and not have it cost more than a regular business? If you're looking at those specific parameters, no, it is going to be more expensive as we stand in the current economy. Hard question, but I'm glad I asked it because, okay, it's good to know. I mean, you're making sacrifices here, but then why would I want to do it? Well, you know, it depends why you got into business in the first place. What I find is that with a lot of the clients that I work with, they didn't start the business to make a quick book. They started it because whether the, the product or the surface, it was something that was really important to them. And, and they're using business as a way to facilitate that value system or that mission. So it just depends what type of business owner you are. It's not for everybody. I meet people and it's very clear that it's not a priority and that's okay. But at the end of the day, that is the direction that businesses are moving in. You see it in some of the biggest companies in the world. They're all participating in it. So, you know, the question is, do you want to get on the train now or do you want to be chasing the train as it's already moving on from the station? I asked Shannon, aka Mama Eco, who, by the way, has an eco-friendly affiliate store on Amazon, to share any last words for small business owners wanting to up their green quotient. If there's a small business listening right now and they're wondering what they can do, I would say the first thing to do would be to to write down all of the different things that you run your business on. So website, mailing list, you use packaging, but write down all of the different things that you use for your business and look at each of those things and say, okay, is there anything here that would be sort of low hanging fruit to start with in terms of sustainability? A, a simple one would be, you know, if you have business cards, what are they printed on? Are they printed on recycled paper? That's like an easy, simple switch. And then another thing too is, is every business runs on electricity which for the most part comes from fossil fuels. And if you have a, a, an energy bill in your name, an electric bill, you can actually, depending on where you're located, switch to getting your energy source from renewable energy. So those are just kind of like a couple of little tips for, for people getting started that are really applicable to, to any business. You don't have to have it all figured out. Your customers don't expect you to have it all figured out, but I can guarantee that if you communicate what you're doing right to your customers now, 
they're going to be lifelong customers because they are invested in your mission. I love that. Shannon, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to help. That was Shannon Kenny, Mama Eco, with lots of great thoughts on ways for small business owners to take steps towards going green. By the way, fun fact, Amazon has partnered with some third-party certifications to highlight products on Amazon that meet the sustainability standards. So if you are a brand that sells on Amazon and you have relevant certifications, that can be shown to customers. I think this is pretty important considering how Marina and Shannon both talked about how customers are increasingly interested in supporting products that help preserve the natural world. You can learn more on our website, thisissmallbusinesspodcast.com, on the show notes. So, per usual, some of the key takeaways for transitioning your business to a sustainable one that I'm adding to my small business playbook after speaking to Marina and Shannon are... 1. Focus on the things that you can control. You might be overwhelmed by everything we hear in the news about climate change, but that doesn't mean that you have to implement huge changes to get on the sustainable train, as Shannon called it. There are small things that you can do that are within your control. Two, small ways in which you can make your small business environmentally friendly are making your website eco-friendly, sourcing as locally as possible, seeing how you can waste less as a business, using recyclable packaging, going fully remote with your team, and remembering that sustainability is also about people. So it's paying and treating your employees fairly. Three, when part of your brand mission is sustainability, advocacy and education are important because you have to go through an additional hurdle of getting consumers to switch their mindsets and adopt new behavior. And to start, it might be better to target those who are able to adopt your solutions first before expanding your reach. And finally, be as transparent as possible with your customers. Be clear with your customers about which of your products and processes are green and which ones may not be. Communicate your values and your mission because that has the potential to make one-time buyers into long-term loyal customers. Bring your customers along on your journey of trying to do right by the planet. They will appreciate your authenticity and maybe even pay a little more to support your mission. After all, everyone wants to do their bit for Mother Earth. So when it comes to saving the planet, the biggest thing for small business owners to remember is you're not alone. On the next episode, I will be talking to two childhood friends that started their small business out of their garage. And now they've grown their business into the first black-owned coffee company with nationally distributed products. They recently made an appearance on The Ellen DeGeneres Show as part of the final season. Meanwhile, if you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you can stay up to date with new episodes. Let us know what you think by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or email us at thisissmallbusiness at amazon.com with episode ideas and tell your friends about us too. Until next time, this is Small Business. I'm your host, Andrea Marquez. Hasta luego, and thanks for listening. This is Small Business is brought to you by Amazon with technical and story production by Jar Audio.
money that it's all too late for that. Here we go. Brand guys, money brand letters in the uh, Northern Patrol. We got a uh, Rodola Arkansas, so you have to buy the game and do it for the game. So. Okay. Building a brand isn't easy, but data-driven insights can make it a little easier. If you're a brand owner selling in Amazon stores, you can make smarter, faster business decisions with powerful reporting from Amazon Brand Analytics. Feed your data cravings with a growing number of reports available from the Brand Analytics dashboard in Seller Central. The Amazon Search Terms report lets you discover which products are winning the most clicks and conversions on strategic search terms. Keep an eye on trends to evaluate the impact of your marketing campaigns. With the Repeat Purchase Behavior Report, you can identify products or brands that customers reorder, advance your strategy, and fine-tune your marketing to drive repeat purchases and acquire new customers. Use the Market Basket Analysis Report to quickly see the top products most commonly purchased alongside your products to identify cross-selling and bundling opportunities. With the Item Comparison Report, Find out which products customers most commonly view together with yours to inform your product portfolio and advertising decisions with competitive intelligence. The Alternate Purchase Report allows you to see the products customers most frequently purchase instead of yours to analyze product differentiation and portfolio mix opportunities. If you sell in the Amazon.com store, the Demographics Report gives you an aggregate breakdown of customers by age, income, education, gender, and marital status. Connect with your target audience and spot opportunities to personalize your marketing efforts. And the best part? Amazon Brand Analytics is offered to brand owners enrolled in Brand Registry at no additional charge. Register your brand today and tap into actionable insights to help you grow your business. Build your brand with Amazon. Welcome to the Automate Pricing video series. After watching, you'll understand how Automate Pricing works, learn how to create a pricing rule, and learn how to reprice your SKUs according to that rule. Let's get started. Automate Pricing adjusts your prices based on the rules you set, saving you time and effort. For example, you may want to make sure your offer is always 10 cents lower than the buy box price. With Automate Pricing, you can set up a rule that will keep your price 10 cents below the buy box price. Then set up a minimum and maximum price so your price doesn't go too high or too low. When the buy box price changes, your price will change shortly after, for as long as the rule is running. If you win the buy box, your price will hold at that value. There are four steps to automate pricing. Step 1. Define the rule parameters. This tells automate pricing when to change your price and what pricing action the rule should take. Step 2. Select the SKUs that you want to reprice. Step 3. Set a minimum and maximum price so your price stays within the range you want. Step 4. Click Start Repricing and Automate Pricing will get to work. Let's look at an example. To access Automate Pricing, log into Seller Central and go to Automate Pricing under the Pricing tab. Go to the bottom of the screen and select Get Started. Next, we define the rule parameters. Start by giving your rule a name. Next, choose whether you want the rule to follow the lowest price or the buy box price. Then choose whether to stay below 
match, or stay above the reference price. Finally, select an amount or percent you'd like to stay above or below the reference price. You can also select filters on your rule. These filters make sure your prices change in specific conditions, like when an item has the same fulfillment channel as you. Read the rule summary at the bottom of your screen to make sure your rule logic matches the logic you have in mind. Then click Save and Select SKUs. Keep in mind that none of your prices will change until you apply your rule, which we'll cover in the next step. Now that your rule is saved, find a SKU you want to automatically price. You can reprice any active in-stock listing in your catalog. Now set a minimum and maximum price. You must enter a minimum and maximum price to ensure your item price stays within the boundaries you set. Click Start Repricing and look for the confirmation message. Once you confirm, your SKU will immediately begin repricing. To stop repricing a SKU, select Move Stop, then choose Stop Automatically Pricing the SKU. Return to the Automate Pricing home screen to edit your rule parameters, add or remove SKUs to your rules, pause or delete your rules, or create a new pricing rule. And that's it! You've created your first pricing rule in automated pricing on a SKU. Welcome to the video module of Manager Customer Engagement. In this video, you will explore the benefits and functionality of the new tool Manager Customer Engagement, which will help your brand connect with Amazon customers. Remember, Manager Customer Engagement is a brand benefit only available to sellers who own a brand. You must be internal to the brand and responsible for selling the brand in the Amazon store. If you are not brand owner but believe you fit a criteria, contact Brand Registry. Ready to start marketing directly to Amazon customers who follow your brand in our store? This training will show you how you can create and send a new product announcement email campaign to Amazon customers. On the Seller Central homepage, hover over the Brands tab and click on the Customer Engagement button. Upon your first login to the tool, you will see a Campaigns screen. When you have campaigns running, you will see the campaign title, status, start end date, and primary ASIN. Select Create Campaign, and a campaign selection pop-up will appear where you select the appropriate brand for this campaign, if you have more than one brand. Review all the information and select the Create Campaign button. Now you will be directed to a screen where you will enter information required for your campaign, your company branding, ASINs, supporting or lifestyle imagery, and the timing of the email campaign. Add a title for your campaign. This title will not be seen by your customers in the email. We recommend you include the ASIN number and name. Email subject lines are pre-populated for your convenience. The section header is included in the body of the email above your hero ASIN. We do not allow you to edit your email subject line or section header. Through Manager Customer Engagement, you can customize the branding of your email. 
Navigate to the brand and layout settings and upload your brand logo. 1. Click the gray box to upload your brand logo. Please use JPEG or PNG. Logos should be in a horizontal format on a transparent background and between 5 to 8 megabytes in size. To crop or zoom in on your ASIN, use the crop slider to increase or decrease the space around your logo. Or if you want to zoom in on your logo, simply use the slider to zoom in or out. Once you complete this step, your logo will appear in the preview section. 2. We recommend selecting a dark background for light logos, and we recommend using the light background option for dark logos. To select a background option, hover over the radial button for dark or light background and click the button. To populate your email with a new product, navigate to the primary ASIN selection section. ASINs are considered new based on the date of their first viable offer. To add an ASIN, type the ASIN number in the search box and select Submit. If you would like to select a different ASIN, click the Clear ASIN button and enter the new ASIN number for the product you would like to use, and then click Submit. Every email features an ASIN and a supporting image for the ASIN. By default, we will display all of the ASIN's supporting images, excluding the primary ASIN image that you have added to your product detail page. You may select any of these product images by clicking the one you would like to use, or you may opt to upload a new supporting image of your own. To upload your own image, hover over the Upload My Own Radial button and click. You may zoom in on your image, simply use the slider to zoom in or out or you may also move the focus of your image within the square image dimensions. Changed your mind? Simply click the Current Detail Page Images radial button to revert back to your detail page supporting images. Our image moderation team will review and either approve or reject the image within three business days. Now to the exciting part, selecting the delivery window for your campaign to send. We allow you to select the week in which your campaign starts sending. Your campaign will need to go through image approval and content before it can begin to run, so please select a time frame in the future. Your campaign will begin sending on the Monday in which you selected and be delivered through Friday. This ensures you target and reach the most significant amount of followers. Ready to start sending? Select the Start Campaign button and you're on your way to sending direct emails to your customers. Once you select Launch, you will see the Campaign Was Successfully Created banner across the top of the site and that it is in a pending status. The best part is that you can easily track the success of your campaign with each send. Simply navigate to manage your customer engagement when your campaign has completed its send time and your campaign will be updated with opens, clicks, and total sent. It's that simple! Start connecting with customers and reach your brand's potential with Manage Your Customer Engagement. Start increasing your brand loyalty and customer lifetime value now. Thank you and happy selling. More resources to automating your e-commerce business, to your center, partner network, to your ads, to your partner. Okay, so we are just going to watch more video about the uh, core example we are able to watch our core every single day and look at our ranking level ok guys so let me show you one more example you drive past the cemetery, you go down the hill, you pass the one exit, you go on the dirt road, and just keep going to the end of the drive, we're the only house along the way. <laughs> I don't need to have a traditional business space. I can basically do it from wherever I want, even if it's the middle of the woods. We are in Fairfield, Iowa. It's pretty far away from any major metropolitan areas. The population is about 9,500 people. So it's always surprising to see what interesting businesses on Amazon are hidden in all the different nooks and crannies around town. I was able to invent a proprietary enzyme in my kitchen sink. I started a line of natural lice treatment and prevention products. Bye, buddy. Love you. Now today we're Logic Products, no longer just Lace Logic, and we have four lines on Amazon. I'm 
make jewelry, I actually weave fabric out of rose gold, yellow gold, or silver wire, and then embed it behind layers of glass that I fuse. I sell ghee. It's a great alternative to regular cooking oil. The process of making ghee involves melting down butter, filtering, pouring into jars, cooling, and then getting it ready for labeling and shipping off to Amazon. Selling on Amazon has been instrumental of our success. So these are the products that we're actually putting in the kits today. We are able to watch our sales every single day, look at our inventory levels. There's a whole bunch of different tools that have become available to you. You make your inventory, you send it in, done. We are really happy to be in a small community and we are continuing to grow and hire people that are looking for work. Our small business has been able to prosper and thrive because of Amazon. They're the best business partner I've had, you know, hands down, period. <laughs>
And once a developer has registered, they can use their profile to integrate additional apps and partner with other sellers or vendors. There are several categories of APIs and apps that professional sellers can choose from, like listing, pricing, and inventory and order management. Apps are also available to assist with compliance, advertising, accounting, and shipping. To review current Amazon-approved apps for each part of the selling lifecycle, log in to Seller Central using your seller credentials. Select Partner Network from the main menu and then click Find Apps and Services. This will bring you to the Amazon Partner Network, or APN. From the APN homepage, select a selling category, then an app to view features and functionality. We provide contact information and web links so sellers can buy and download apps. If you'd like to use an app that isn't yet available on the APN, or use a private app not listed by Amazon, you can work with developers to create and integrate a new application with SP API. In some cases, sellers build and integrate an app themselves. They develop an application for their selling account with the option to publish it on the APN and make it available to other sellers or vendors. Professional developers who want to publish apps for purchase and use by Amazon sellers or vendors can also set up a professional selling account for that purpose. In many cases, sellers don't create and integrate new apps with SP API themselves, but instead partner with third-party developers. Apps created through these partnerships can have all the functionality and features available to seller or vendor-created apps. They just require the seller or vendor to authorize the developer's access to selling data during the integration process. Whether you're a seller developing a new app yourself or are partnering with a developer, the first step for using SP API is developer registration. Registration is free and ensures approval to integrate the app. Make sure you or your developer register if you don't already have an SP API profile. Let's quickly review some of SP API's technical features. Then we'll complete our overview of SP API by providing step-by-step -step instructions for registering as a developer. SP API is a modernized suite of REST APIs that reflect current development standards. It includes a test endpoint or sandbox and OAuth 2.0 authorization using Login with Amazon or LWA. Experienced developers might recognize SP API's features and functionality as an evolution of Marketplace Web Services or Amazon MWS. This earlier version of our API service still offers many of the same basic operations now available through SP API. But SP API also offers developers, sellers, and vendors an enhanced suite of automation functionality. It's important to note that all new API functionality will be available exclusively through SP API. Updates to MWS only occur to support business critical changes. MWS is being slowly deprecated and all new developer registrations must be for SP API. It's also worth noting that if you're a developer with an MWS application, you can convert it to a hybrid SP API application to take advantage of SP API's enhanced functionality. You can also migrate an application authorization from MWS to SP API. For more information about converting an application, refer to our module Integrate with SP API. Step 2. Register an application for SP API. And if you'd like more information about migrating an authorization, refer to the relevant Step 3 modules in the same series. Step 3A. Set up a Test Amazon Partner Network Authorization Workflow or Step 3B. Set up a Test Website Authorization Workflow. Now that you're familiar with SP API's technical features, let's review the developer registration process. The way you register as a developer will vary based on the type of application you want to integrate, public or private, for a seller or vendor. A public application is publicly available, while a private application is only available to its organization. Both public and private applications can be built for sellers or vendors. If an application is public, it's authorized by the seller or vendor. If an application is private, it's self-authorized by the developer, who is also the seller or vendor. 
You'll register the same way if you want to integrate a public seller, public vendor, or private seller app. We'll review that process first. If you want to register as a developer to integrate a private vendor app, you'll follow a slightly different process. We'll review that second. Start the developer registration process for a public seller, public vendor, or private seller application by signing in to Seller Central at sellercentral.amazon.com. Use the credentials you want associated with your developer account, which you'll receive directly from the seller or vendor. Note that you'll sign in to Seller Central even for a public vendor application. After signing in, select Partner Network from the main menu, then click Develop Apps. This will take you to Developer Central. Click Proceed to Developer Profile, then complete the Developer Profile form. You'll provide contact information, data access specifications, use cases, and information about your security controls. In the Data Access section, use the drop-down to select My Organization Builds and Offers Publicly Available Applications to build and integrate public seller or public vendor apps. Select My Organization Sells in the Amazon Store and I only want to integrate to manage my own business for private seller apps. You'll also select roles for your developer profile based on the needs of your application. If you select a restricted role for your profile, you'll be prompted to provide additional information about your data use and security controls. A new field will appear after you select the restricted role. For more information about roles, restrictions, and protections for personally identifiable information, or PII, refer to our module Introduction to SPAPI Roles. After you've completed the entire Developer Profile form, click the Register button at the bottom to submit it to Amazon for evaluation. If you'd like to register as a developer to integrate a private vendor application with SPAPI, you'll follow a slightly different process. Start by signing in to Vendor Central at vendorcentral.amazon.com. Use the credentials associated with the vendor group or groups you want your application to access. If you don't have the necessary credentials, obtain them from your vendor. If you'd like more information about vendor groups, search for the Selling Partner API Developer Guide on GitHub, then select About Vendor Groups from the Table of Contents. After signing into Vendor Central, select the Integration menu, then click API Integration. This will bring you to Developer Central. Click Proceed to Developer Profile, then complete the Developer Profile form. You'll provide contact information, data access specifications, use cases, and information about your security controls, just like a developer registering in Seller Central. In the Data Access section, use the drop-down to select My Organization Sells on Amazon and I only want to integrate to manage my own business since you're integrating a private vendor app. You'll also only be able to select roles relevant to vendor applications. Once you've completed the entire Developer Profile form, click the Register button at the bottom. After you submit your Developer Profile, we'll assess if the information you provided complies with our SPAPI Acceptable Use Policy and Amazon's Data Protection Policy. We recommend reviewing these policies before you submit. You can access them using the links at the top of the Developer Registration form. We also use the information you submit for your developer profile to ensure that we provide you with the appropriate level of access. Your access to selling data is determined by the type of app you intend to integrate with SPAPI, seller or vendor, public or private, as well as the roles you selected. Once your profile has been evaluated, we'll either approve your SPAPI registration or provide you with an opportunity to add to or clarify aspects of your profile so you can resubmit. We create a support case automatically when you first submit your registration. If you receive a message that your registration has been denied, it'll contain instructions for addressing the cause. You won't be able to change your developer profile while we review it, but you can monitor your registration status anytime by going back to Developer Central in either Seller Central or Vendor Central. Follow the instructions in the Your Developer Registration is Under Review banner. These change to reflect the current status of your developer profile. 
This concludes our overview of SP API. If you'd like to learn more, search for the Selling Partner API Developer Guide on GitHub. And if you're ready to integrate an app with SP API, proceed to the modules in our Integrate with SP API series. Thanks for watching. Okay guys, so we saw the many videos about uh, this business, so grow your business, grow your business, so I gave you the uh, lots of videos about it. So let me show you some more. I'm Jenny Wong Stanley from Art of Plants, and I am an extreme wood bender. What that means is I bend wood in various shapes for decor. So I love these imperfections, these knots and stuff, and I try to keep them, but some of them are not going to bend well, so keep what I can. When I started bending wood, it was a complete accident. I came across this article. It was like this one pager that says like this guy bent a very small radius on like juniper or oak. And so I took out my lobster pot and I found a wooden ruler. I threw it in the pot, I steamed it. There was no instruction, so I just thought I'd try it. And I proceeded to break it, of course. Experimental science was like something I really loved doing. I couldn't stop myself from trying to get it correct. Like I couldn't leave it alone. I would not sleep thinking it has to be the heating variable. Okay, if it's not the heating variable and if I keep that constant, what other variables are there, right? Prior to me doing what I do now, bending wood, I found out that I had depression and a bipolar two. I didn't realize the second one until much later. I loved my focus, whatever that is, and I wouldn't think about anything else except that, or I would be really, really down if I didn't have that. I would just lie on the couch and cry all weekend long, but there was no particular reason why I was sad, if that makes any sense. It's not like there was a traumatic moment that happened. So I found a lot of things did help me with uh, trying to get my mood down with depression and bipolar too, and art happened to be one of those things. It was really relaxing to just work with my hands and repeat and repeat. I love using my hands. I love the bending of the wood because I know how to do it to a certain extent now. I mean, like, sure, I'm still trying to get 100% perfection. That will never happen, right? But the fact that I'm struggling to do it really helps me concentrate on the problem at hand and I'm not thinking about anything else and really does help. One of these pieces takes anywhere between five to seven days because there, there are many steps. The bending part is the shortest part of the entire process. I have 30 seconds to bend my full sculpture. It's making a funny noise.
I got it. <laughs> Tense moments. So one of the challenges for me, and I think it's probably unique to people who can't mass produce, is that I have to do everything by hand and work really hard to make it amazing. And so each piece is unique. I like that part. The most important pieces to me are the ones that I can incorporate the imperfections of the wood. So I have some that are like, have like large knots. And I actually write in the card when I send it, I was like, oh my gosh, you got one though. One of my favorites, it has like a giant knot. I feel as if you kind of have to love doing this. I'm lucky to make it sustainable. And so it's been, 10 to 12 years and I'm still working on it, so. I can't see myself ever not doing it. It's just my life, it's built into me and I love it. I'll stop doing it the moment I stop loving it, but I don't see that happening. So guys, so this is the Eustachian is open, Amazon, Suggestion, Seller, so you want to see on the website. <laughs> Hey! 
we want to demonstrate that Amazon is the best partner for you. Continue your journey in building a successful brand. this one this is very important comparing the cloth Welcome to our training on the Manage Your Compliance Dashboard. In this module, you'll learn how to view and respond to product compliance requests and how to submit the required documentation. You'll also learn how to appeal compliance requests. It's important that products in the Amazon store are safe for customers to use and that listings are fair for all sellers. Everyone who shops and sells in the Amazon store must be able to trust that the products are held to the highest standards. It's also important that sellers can file and organize all the necessary information and documentation to show that their products comply with Amazon's policies and government standards and regulations. The Manager Compliance Dashboard is designed to make this process easier by allowing you to organize, submit, and track your compliance documentation in one central place. To reach the Manager Compliance Dashboard, open the top menu by selecting the button with three horizontal lines in the top left corner of the Seller Central homepage. Under Performance, select Account Health. Once you're on the Account Health Dashboard, scroll to the bottom of the page to find a Manager Compliance card. From here, you can navigate to the Manager Compliance Dashboard. This dashboard will show you, at a glance, any products that require documentation. The dashboard shows not only each product's name, but also their Amazon Standard Identification Numbers, or ASINs, as well as their Stock Keeping Unit Numbers, or SKUs. You can see the specific documents or information that are required and the date by which they must be provided. You can also see the approval status for any documentation or information you've submitted. You may be required to provide compliance documents or information if you intend to sell a product that's subject to restrictions in your region's store. The specific class of documents or information you need to upload is displayed on the dashboard. To submit them, select the Add Appeal Compliance button to go to the Add Compliance page. For each category of document that's been requested, you can drag and drop a file to upload or browse your hard drive to find and select a file. If you need more information about a request, hover over the question mark next to the name of the request type. Remember that files must be less than 25 megabytes and can only be submitted in a supported format as indicated on the submission page. If the files you submitted aren't supported, you'll get an error and will need to upload a new file. If you feel that you need to explain any of your documents further, you can provide that information in additional comments. If you believe the request was made in error, you can appeal. To do so, select Appeal Request above the area for submitting documents. When you appeal, you must provide a reason. Select the appeal reason from the drop-down list. Again, you can explain your reason for the appeal in more detail in the additional comments field. Once you've provided the documents you need, select Submit. 
You can see the status of any of your compliance submissions or appeal requests from the Manage Your Compliance dashboard. If you select any item, you'll see an overview of the current status. Remember that customer safety is everyone's responsibility. By working together to document your product's compliance with policies and regulations, we can help customers trust that products they purchase in the Amazon store are of the highest quality and safe to use. While different types of products may have different requirements, the Manage Your Compliance dashboard will help you organize and monitor all compliance requests for your offers. Whenever you need to check this dashboard, select Account Health under the Performance menu and then select the card for Manage Your Compliance. And if you need information about specific product types, check the Product Compliance Documentation Help page on Seller Central for information about the types of documentation we request. To watch this video again, search for Manager Compliance Dashboard on Seller University or bookmark the page you're on right now for future reference. This concludes our training on the Manager Compliance Dashboard. Thank you and happy selling in the Amazon store! Welcome to our Compliance Reference Tool Training. Thanks for having me. Today, we'll introduce a tool to help you learn about compliance requirements and get the correct documentation when selling in the Amazon store. You're a new seller, right? Right. I just made my account a month ago. How's the selling going? Well, I haven't started selling quite yet. Oh well. Tell me about your situation and let's see how I can help. Okay. So, I want to start selling in the Amazon store, but I'm not sure about one thing. What's compliance? Is that just following Amazon's policies? Compliance isn't just about following Amazon's policies. It's about following the laws, regulations, and standards. If you're selling something like toys, there are different safety standards that your toys have to meet first. Ugh, why are there so many rules? Do I have to do this? You need to take safety seriously. If a product doesn't comply with safety standards, someone's health could be at risk. That's a good point. That's why, if your products don't have the right compliance documentation, your listings could get taken down, which might affect your account health. If you ship internationally, non-compliance items might get stopped in customs. And if you have inventory at Amazon fulfillment centers, it might be destroyed if it turns out you're not compliant. We don't want that. Nobody does. So, how do I know what documentation I need? Do I just figure it all out myself? You should always do your own research. But Amazon has a tool that can help you. The Compliance Reference Tool. You can access it from the page for adding products. You know where to find that page, right? Yeah, there are two ways to do it from the main menu. One is by selecting Add Products under Catalog and the other is add a product in inventory. That's right. And now that you're on the page for adding products, scroll down to find compliance reference. Learn compliance requirements and service providers for your products. What's this? Select Compliance Self-Assessment and find out. It's a disclaimer. That's right. Remember that it's your responsibility to have complete and accurate compliance information. The tool I'm about to show you is informational, but it's your job to make sure that you do everything correctly. Makes sense. I'll select Confirm. Whoa, look at this. This is the Compliance Reference Tool. It's a treasure trove of information. Just select the region you ship from and the store where you want to sell, and then enter your product type. Select a category from the drop-down menu and type a keyword, or search from the list. If you have an HS code, you can use that too. What's an HS code? It stands for Harmonized System Code. It's an international standard six-digit tariff code for product categories. If you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. Here, it's just another way to find the product category you're using. Once you find a category, you'll see a product type description. Okay, so let's say I'm looking at toys.
So I start on the left and keep selecting as I move, right? Until I find the product type I'm looking for. Wow. There's a list of the documentation information. Make sure you check the different information tabs too. For toys, there's one set for product compliance and another for dangerous goods compliance. What if my product isn't listed here? Does that mean I don't need compliance documentation for it? Not always. It's also possible that your product is in a different category than you thought. If you can't find your product, try looking at a similar product and see what compliance documents are there. Some of those may apply to your product. And even if you can't find a similar product, that doesn't mean you don't need compliance documentation. It may just mean that your product isn't in the database yet. Product compliance regulations may change, and while the compliance reference tool is updated frequently, it is your responsibility to make sure that you don't need anything extra that's not included in this list. Got it. So I'll start with the documents listed here. But I don't know how to get all these certifications. Who can help me? Scroll down. This? Wait, is this? It's a list of providers who may be able to help you get the documentation you need. Each provider's entry includes their name and the services they provide. It also shows you the country and city where you can find them. It even shows their contact information. <laughs> this is incredible. They're all in the same country, though. Do you see the drop-down list at the upper right that says country? You can select the country to see service providers in that region. So this tells me who can provide the services I need and where I can find them? It does more than that. Select the providers you're interested in by using the checkboxes. You can even select ones from several different countries. Your selections are attained when you change lists. Okay, now what? Scroll up to where it says, Service Provider Pool on the right. It says I've selected three. Right. Now select Create Report. Oh, wow. It's a printable report. This report lists the types of compliance documentation you need for your product type as well as the service providers you selected. There's also a list of trade export compliance requirements for each SS code within that product type. This is amazing. This tool does everything for me. Not everything. You're still responsible for making sure the service providers are right for you and that their services are up to date. Remember that you may need to get help from service providers that aren't on this list or even prepare some documents yourself. Good point. But still, this lets me know where to start and saves me a lot of work. That's true. Thank you for showing me this. I was nervous about selling because compliance is so important. It'd be terrible if someone didn't get their order because I wasn't thorough enough with compliance. But now I can go right from the page for adding products and get a whole report about compliance for each product type I want to sell. And I can print it out or save it as a PDF so I can share with others who work with me. That's right. And that concludes our training on the Compliance Reference Tool. Thank you. Happy selling in the Amazon store. If somebody comes up to us and says, I don't really like tea, what we say back to them is, you just haven't found the right tea. Black tea has the most caffeine content and it gets things going. Hibiscus teas are great. They quench that thirst. Chamomile is a, is a natural sedative. Tulsi helps with the mind and stress. So if we can narrow that down into something that you can enjoy on a daily basis, that's what we're here for. My name is Thomas Egbert. I am the creator and founder of Fusion Teas, and we are located in McKinney, Texas. Our specialty is loose leaf teas. We have over 130 different teas and blends. We also have accessories to go with that. Amazon is the catapult. Being a new brand, you don't have any trust yet. How do you build that? It was very easy to get that trust from the customers by being on Amazon. T 
is all about connection. That's kind of our passion, and that's what gives us the greatest joy. Your seller account set up, you've got the hang of selling on Amazon, and you're ready to grow. Ready for to help reach more customers, increase sales, and engage shoppers throughout their journey, consider taking advantage of advertising, promotions, lightning deals, and coupons. When used together, they can create the momentum you need to carry your business to new heights. Get instant visibility with cost-per-click ads. Sponsored products display within Amazon search results and on product pages, right where customers see them. Sponsored brands, available to brand owners, take it a step further, featuring your logo, headline, and up to three products, helping shoppers see your brand the way you want it to be seen. You control how much you spend and how long the campaign runs, and you only pay when they click. Customers also love getting a deal. Help them out by running lightning deal flash sales on one of the most visited pages on Amazon or offer coupons, allowing users to click for savings in search results on product pages or in their shopping carts. Promotions can also help make the sale, offer free shipping, percentage discounts, or buy one, get one free promos and get a custom Amazon URL to share in your marketing campaigns. Promoting products can be vital to your Amazon strategy, helping you drive sales, launch new products, generate reviews, and more. The right audience, the right place, and the right time. Give your listings the attention they deserve and start advertising today. Build your business with Amazon. Some things in life are just better together. Think of peanut butter and jelly, or of salt and pepper. These items can be sold on their own, or they can be offered as a bundle instead. Customers love bundles because they can buy what they need together and save. And brand owners love bundles because they can help increase sales and brand loyalty. With the new Virtual Bundles tool, it's easier than ever to create bundles using your fulfillment by Amazon inventory. We call them Virtual Bundles because you don't have to package your bundle together. Instead, when a customer buys a virtual bundle, Amazon ships them all the items making up the bundle using your existing FBA inventory. That means you can create bundles in just a few minutes and see what resonates with your customers. No need to change anything about the way you package and send products to our fulfillment centers. To create a virtual bundle, first decide which products will be included in your bundle. You might use a tool like Amazon Brand Analytics to see what your customers are already buying together. Next, use our Virtual Bundles tool to add a title and images for your bundle. Finally, determine your bundle price. Offering discounts can help increase bundle sales. Easy enough! Set up your first virtual bundle today. Customers will love seeing more of what your brand has to offer. Build your brand with Amazon. Customers love being the first to learn about new products from their favorite brands. They feel even more appreciated when a brand shares promotions. And once they know and follow a brand, they're more likely to become loyal and engaged repeat customers. Amazon's new Manage Your Customer Engagement tool connects customers and brands and empowers your brand to help build loyal relationships, increase retention, and drive engagement with customers in Amazon stores. Available to brand owners enrolled in brand registry, the Manage Your Customer Engagement tool lets you manage your content and send email campaigns to customers who have purchased products from you in Amazon stores. For the first time ever, take advantage of email marketing to help strengthen the customer brand relationship and provide inspiration-driven shopping experiences. Send new product launch announcements, offer promotions, inspire repeat purchases, and more to help drive brand loyalty in Amazon stores. The best part? monitoring the impact of your campaigns and customer engagement with key performance metrics. Create your first campaign today. Build your brand with Amazon.
When I found out that we were pregnant with our second child, I started looking at products for our baby registry. I wanted something that made me feel good, but that was also in style right now. I wanted it to have a pattern that everyone was like, oh my goodness, that's so cute. And that's when we decided that we were gonna start our brand Kids and Such. My name is Channing and this is my husband, Justin, and we sell products for mom and baby. One of my favorite ones, we have what's called a multi-use cover. The bottom has a burp cloth, so you can nurse and you can also flip it over your shoulder so that you can burp the baby right after you feed. It's been interesting testing out our products. I totally have worn the nursing cover and pretended to nurse my fake baby. <laughs> in the beginning, we had no idea how to get in front of our customer. And for Amazon, it's already there. So we launched our business straight out of the gate on Amazon. Went from about 20 to 30K a month, all the way to 130K a month. Mind blown. And here we are. <laughs>
We used to get one new dress every year if things went well. And we didn't have a really big school, just a small building. We used to sit on the ground and study. It was a beautiful childhood too. We were close to our parents. Whatever we used to get, we used to share and always be happy with each other. I had to really work hard to get a scholarship. I became an electrical engineer. I worked in a corporate world for a while. But I never enjoyed working in a 9-to-5 job. It didn't motivate me. So I started Avacraft. I am Asha Vivek, CEO of Avacraft based in uh, Lone Star, Texas. We make really high quality kitchen products. The inspiration for uh, building Avacraft is my family. Uh, I love my family. I enjoy cooking for them. I try to learn all the new cuisines and try making it at home. I am always in the kitchen, so I thought this is the best field. I can create really high quality kitchen products. I didn't have any idea on the design process, uh, anything about the metal composition, no idea on anything. Sometimes I felt, uh, what am I doing? This a new shipment of glass carafe has come, pretty excited about it. This is the final product. Uh, after all the prototypes, you can see. This is my first prototype. The quality I didn't like as it breaks very often. This is the second prototype. Thinking that I made it little tall. In the third prototype, if you see here, you can see a slant, but still the uh, body was bulky. This is the final product after all the prototype. I'm so happy about it. You can use it for water, juice, wine, for everything. My husband Vivek, he instills a lot of um, positivity and inspiration in me. One of the things that Asha actually does in her business a lot, it's like she gets a lot of feedback from customers and she has actually gone ahead and changed the whole, whole mold and the process. She really wants to create something that people can believe in. We have always got your back is our motto. It's just been two years, but I see a tremendous growth in the company. It's been an amazing journey. I feel really good because I can spend a lot of time with Vivek and my two daughters. When we moved from India, we came directly to Dallas. It's a good city, good schools. We all are so into doing biking and doing running and we can find a trail everywhere. So whenever we uh, visit India, we make sure we take our kids to my school or where I grew up and where Vivek grew up to show them where we were and where we are here now. Everything is possible. Work hard, keep faith. That's it. Okay guys, so uh, this was our lesson today, so which one we uh, discuss, we watch lots of videos, we watch Some things in life are just better together. Think of peanut butter and jelly, or of salt and pepper. These items can be sold on their own, or they can be offered as a bundle instead. Customers love bundles because they can buy what they need together and save. And brand owners love bundles because they can help increase sales and brand loyalty. With the new Virtual Bundles tool, it's easier than ever to create bundles using your fulfillment by Amazon inventory. We call them Virtual Bundles because you don't have to package your bundle together. Instead, when a customer buys a Virtual Bundle, Amazon ships them all the items making up the bundle using your existing FBA inventory. That means you can create bundles in just a few minutes and see what resonates with your customers. No need to change anything about the way you package and send products to our fulfillment centers. To create a virtual bundle, first decide which products will be included in your bundle. You might use a tool like Amazon Brand Analytics to see what your customers are already buying together. Next, use our virtual bundles tool to add a title and images for your bundle. Finally, determine your bundle price. Offering discounts can help increase bundle sales. Easy enough! Set up your first virtual bundle today. Customers will love seeing more of what your brand has to offer. Build your brand with Amazon. Okay guys, so today's uh, video is on to so our next one. So take care of yourself, take care of all your people. If you like this video, like it and share it to your friends and your family. Please click the next video. See you next time.
social media channel bye bye if you like this video like it and share bye bye next video